Hello everyone. Hope you're having a great day. I'm excited to answer the questions uh, today. It's a beautiful day here in Philadelphia after a major thunderstorm last night. And um, where I'm at right now, I don't have to wear a mask. Philadelphia has gone um, maskless now. So it's really, really nice. I've got my shots. I feel good uh, about it. And I hope all of you are able to do the same in short order if you're not already. So let's tackle these questions. So the first question is from Heather Brockman. Heather asked, what's the best way to get ETA sent to clients without the office setting times and adding extra stress for groomers? This is a description of her background. The way we have things set up now, the groomers send out ETAs the evening before their shift to give two hour time frame to the clients. The problem is sometimes they work late. ETAs don't always get sent and clients get pissed. I don't know the best way to establish an arrival time without infringing on the groomer's time or not accounting for traffic. And if groomers work late, how do I get around this? We offer a high-end holistic grooming experience for busy pet owners whose animals are part of the family. I'm sure by now, it, uh, if you've been doing it for a while, that you have a typical amount of time that you know that it takes to do whatever the groomers are doing, whatever the customer is paying for. And I think you should be able to go and say, if it takes an hour to do something, then tack on an extra 15 minutes to 30 minutes. I don't think it's such a problem for the owner, uh, for the pet to be waiting for the owner. The problem, right, is for the owner to be waiting for the pet. They just want to come in, swoop up their pet, and be on their way. So whatever that is, I might add an extra half an hour onto it and then put the pet away. And then when the owner comes, you've got plenty of time to go and do it. Because otherwise, it gets very frustrating if the owner has to come there and sit and wait in their car or wait in your lobby. Now, if you are also selling other items and you want the pet owner to wait and so that they take a look at what you're selling and possibly buy things from you, that's a different thing and that's a different strategy. But if you are just doing the grooming work, I would put an extra half an hour onto the time so that way they know when to pick it up and there's no chance that you're going to be late in getting them and you'll have a happy customer. Uh, Nico Garcia. Uh, right. Should I go out and seek a co-founder who is more knowledgeable in business and a successful entrepreneur? It's funny, I'm, I'm struggling with this myself. Uh, my product is a unique storage jar for the cannabis industry. I'm a one-man band without any formal education or background in business. Sometimes I feel like I should have someone on the team who's already led us, uh, led a successful business brand to help lead the way. I'm more of a creative who tends to focus more on the brand and innovation of the products rather than the business side of it. It's funny, I have some of the same problem myself. I've run a lot of businesses, but I really would prefer uh, to have somebody else doing the sales. And I think that's what you're basically saying is you've come up with a great idea. Selling things is not really your thing, but you'd like to come up with someone else. I, I think it's a good idea for you to search for somebody who could be a partner with you and depending on how much you've already invested, give them equity that's earned over time based on the amount of sales that they do. So you might give them some equity in the beginning uh, just for coming on board, but for them to off own the vast majority of equity that you're willing to offer, then they have to go and hit certain milestones with sales. And it could be a variety of things. It could be they have to get the break even for you or they have to um, grow the base of business uh, by 10% a month or 20% a year. You need to set some kind of goals. But I would definitely go shopping for someone who uh, could be a partner for you, who understands how to build businesses. And I'd look for somebody who's built something similar to what you're offering because those people have a, a certain experience with that. And I would definitely hire, I would not hire someone who came from a big brand already where the brand sells itself. I can't tell you how many entrepreneurs make the mistake of hiring big uh, people from big brands 
and the brand sold themselves and when they get into a brand that's not even known they're not able to go and sell it because they're really not that good in sales to begin with so I would get someone who's been with a pure startup understands what it's like to work with very little money has sold something that nobody's ever heard of before or a name of a company no one's ever heard of before and then have them work with you on building that business and make sure you're compatible from a personality side it's important because it's like a marriage if, if you get somebody who's a partner and they don't have the same work ethic that you do they're not uh, somebody who is if you're like me I'm very calm I'm very practical I'm very logical so I need that uh, kind of partner are they driven uh, to success are they willing to work 80 90 hours a week to make it happen I've been in partnerships where I thought the person was going to be great based on their background and uh, I started working with them but then once we raised the money they weren't willing to work as hard as I was and the venture eventually failed because they weren't willing to put that effort in so you really have to get someone in that you think is a good match for you and I would start them as a consultant and let's see how it works and I would be honest with them and tell them listen I think it's best that we start on a consulting relationship that I'm going to give you some equity in the business but I need to be able to know and you need to know can you actually sell this if you can sell it then we're both going to be happy if you don't, can't sell it then neither of us is going to be any uh, happy and that won't work out very well for uh, you or I the next question comes from Christian uh, Kristen latest Kristen writes what are some of the most effective market research strategies when you have trouble getting in touch with online entrepreneurs making above six figures uh, and her description of her business is I am a launch copywriter for online entrepreneurs I want to shift my messaging and branding towards higher level entrepreneurs but have trouble getting in touch with them to ask questions it's either I never get a reply or an assistant will say no to me I also can't tell who makes the kind of money just by looking at their profile I write sales copy for online coaches launching product services who want to grow their business through pervasive writing well first of all if you can't do it with what you're writing to them how are you going to be able to sell it to them so what I would do if I were you and I do this now I would go on LinkedIn and look for CEOs of companies that fit the profile and write to them but if you can't write a pervasive email to them that they should um, speak to you about offering the same thing in fact your emails themselves should sell themselves to the point that the CEO looks at that email and says man I wish I could write like that or I wish my people could write like that or wish my outbound communication was like that so I want to hire that person to do that so I think it all starts with you first making sure that you have a, a good written communication that sells what you do and the other part is is that you could go on LinkedIn and identify folks that you would like to write to I'm written to every day by people uh, and I find that most of who writes to me writes way too long uh, email messages because I'm not uh, somebody who's going to read more than about a paragraph when I write to people I only write a paragraph and the other thing is you can go by email list and uh, they're not that expensive to go and buy I mean you can probably get a couple thousand maybe even five thousand people on a list for a couple thousand dollars and so that might be worth it to you as well to go and do it but at the end of the day I think in what you're doing if you can't write to people and persuade them with the emails that you're sending about yourself that's gonna be a hard sell to those people as well The next question I have is from Lib Gruber. Lib uh, writes, what steps do, uh, do we need to take to manufacture a product? We want to manufacture a specific lamp. I found a model that I, I like on Alibaba, but I would like to customize it further. I talked to a product design firm, Rabbit, that could help us, but it will be relatively expensive to go through them. I know you can ask manufacturers on Alibaba to customize items for you but I want to make sure everything is done right and good quality thank you 
Liv, you kind of answered this question already, and that is you went to a product design firm. The folks who would do it for you as a manufacturer still need a product design from you, and they might have product design people in-house that they could go and model this for you, but more than likely, those people aren't as good as getting a really good consulting firm who does this for a living. So I, I, I don't see a way around spending reasonably good money, and especially if it's a product that you're hoping to make a lot of money off of, then it's worth to go and get that kind of designer and find a designer who's worked with this type of product. You know, you don't want a designer who de, uh, who's good at product design of, let's say, um, bathtubs or uh, fireplaces. You want somebody who's designed a similar type of products, which you're talking about lamps, and they might have a, um, a, a good creativity gene uh, that's good for them when they do this type of thing. And, they, and you should look at the process and methodology they go through to understand exactly what you want and how you want it done. But I, I don't think there's a way around going after I've, I've worked with lots of clients who um, like something and then they want to redesign it in a certain way and then sell it. And I, I've never seen it successful where they've gone directly to a manufacturer unless they had their own capability in-house to design, show them something, because they need plans to work from. And that's probably the best way to go about it. Uh, I wish there was an easier way, but certainly you're asking to do it the right way, and I would say that's the right way. The next question comes from Muriel Goodrich. Uh, Muriel writes, how do I know if I'm charging appropriately for a new concept? Here it is. Isle Bartan is a concierge mixology service for private and public events. We specialize in organic fresh fruit and herb cocktails and mocktails. We are a full service caterer for a bar side of events. We graphic design custom menus for every event based on themes, guests of honor, and clients' desires. The menu only serves as a guide and we encourage guests to create their own cocktails or mocktails from Fresh Fruit Bar and with the guidance of Fresh Fruit Mixologists. We have laser engraved coconuts and take our themes very seriously. It's an interactive entertainment experience. I'm finding that new potential clients are having major sticker shock for my proposals. There's no there is really no comparable company as I developed all of these recipes myself. The fact that we are using organic fruit causes our service to be more expensive than a bar that would use things like processed sour mix and juices from concentrate. I'm only making profit from prep and service time. Everything else is direct pricing to customers as I do not have a liquor license and do not have a brick and mortar to, uh, to store fruits. I don't think people realize the real meat of the cost is in themes, supplies, liquor, and fruit. I do not make anything off of that. Other mobile bark services, by the way, you should make money off of all of these aspects of what you're offering. I don't think people realize the real meat of the cost of themes, supplies, and so forth. Other uh, mobile bar services just show up and pour what is provided or supply a small menu using your average mixers and liquors. All 500 of our recipes, wow, 500 of our recipes can be made with or without liquor because the fruits and herbs are giving the flavor, not the liquor. Thank you in advance. I'm excited to be a part of the AO team. So how do I appropriately charge approximately for a new concept? Well, look, sometimes you have a new concept and people just don't want to buy that new concept because they're looking for the least expensive thing to offer uh, when they're doing this. So you have to go and find uh, clients that would want to buy this type of thing. So you might buy an email list for the region that you're in, because I'm assuming you can't, you're not traveling across the country. You probably don't want to drive maximum two hours, probably not more than an hour. And I would contact uh, list brokers for organic magazines, like people who read organic magazines or read healthy magazines are the most likely people to want to buy your service. I would also see if you could partner with high-end caterers who could uh, charge 
for your services and make money and that they're dealing with people who don't think twice about spending a lot of money but they have to be people that live a healthy lifestyle that read things about organic food that buy organic food they're going to get it and they already don't mind spending the extra money on themselves and if they're running an event they're probably the best people to do it i would create a spreadsheet that puts in all the prices of all all the elements that take to make this and I would put in that spreadsheet how much time it takes to make each cocktail and how much you have to pay somebody per hour to go and do this and then you also have to track um, charge for your time to pitch the uh, clients your time to get to the uh, facility where you're doing this and the amount of time that you're spending there along with factoring in that if you're providing all the equipment what does that cost you and if you find that you can't make a living uh, doing this that you uh, it's just too expensive then the market's just not ready for what you're offering but I would put it all in a spreadsheet I've helped clients do this in the past create that spreadsheet show customers here's what all the costs are just so you understand what this is and then I add 20 or 25 percent to it because hey, at the end of the day, I need to make money as well, or whatever the margin is that you feel is appropriate uh, to go and do, offer. And the other thing is you might consider doing this uh, kind of thing online and showing people about your 500 recipes and targeting events planners so they can see it or running an event for event planners so they can go and taste it so they can go and recommend you out there but at the end of the day your real question was how do I go and price it create that spreadsheet that factors in all of the costs including the time to do everything time to um, go and leave the place and get to where it get home again put all of that in and then you're able to go and give them a price and mark it up at least 20% maybe it's 25% that you're marking this up and once you can get a hot couple of high profile clients then people are going to want to have you just to say that they had you at their event and and show your particular offering so that's what i would do if i were you the next uh, question comes from tatiana uh, mametti and tatiana writes what are some of the ways i can re reward my employees to keep them motivated and excited in a quick service type restaurant the summer gets really busy and we want to do something exciting where we give someone 500 to a thousand dollar bonus at the end of the season i was thinking a chart to keep track so people can really get excited i don't want to be a cutthroat competition i want the team to work well together and i want them to feel appreciated so what you could do is create a few different measurements one is getting your all your employees that when they give the product uh, to your customers that they said if you like this product please put something on the web or send uh, my boss an email and say how much you like it and you can put it online you can send us an email something that set, tells us if you thought it was good if you didn't think it was good that's okay too uh, we would love to get the feedback to improve so you could get, give them a bonus based on a few things. One is getting positive emails, two is getting feedback that will improve the business, three is that you could say to them, I will give a bonus that if you stay from the beginning of the summer to the end of the summer and we increase our sales by a certain percentage of the last year, maybe it's 10%, maybe it's 20%, you will get different levels of bonus. So if we hit certain things, you'll get 500, then 750, then 1,000 whatever that number is so you don't want to be an all or nothing thing or there's no incentive but they need to know that if they hit certain junctures the bonus keeps growing higher and higher and especially if there's more sales so if people really like coming into your place and they find everybody to be really friendly and they want to come back again and the quality is there then you're going to be golden you're going to make a lot of money uh, doing that but if you're looking again to not make it individual and you want to make it team oriented then you got to create different bonuses that are going to hit different parts of the business 
or you're going to get bonuses out by different groups in the business. You know, maybe the cashiers get a certain type of bonus. Maybe the people who are cooking the food get a certain type of bonus. Maybe the bus boys get a certain type of bonus uh, on there. But create, maybe you're creating different bonus pools for groups, or maybe it's just one bonus pool for everybody, but they all know what they, uh, what they have to achieve in order for them to get that bonus. But they know that if they get this minimum done, they're going to get a certain amount of bonus, but they've got to stay the entire time. They can't just leave. And you have to make it, if they're college kids, then it's got to cut off of the time when the kids are leaving school because it's not fair to them. So again, that's what I would do if I were you. And I think that's great that you want to do that. The next uh, question comes from AJ, and I think it's uh, Coates, C-O-U-T-T-S. And AJ writes, how do you choose where to focus when everything needs work? Here's the description. Maybe it's the phase of business growth, or perhaps it's my perspective, but I feel like nothing we're executing for our clients is performing nearly as well as it should be. I feel like the spinning plate entertainment guy who is always bouncing from one plate that's about to fall to another. With many different types of plates wobbling, I'm really struggling to apply my focus to really excelling at one thing. Every entrepreneur feels this. I mean, I can't, I feel it, we all feel it. What I like to do is I like to say, what's the most important things that I have to get done uh, for my clients. What are the things I should work on and what are things that when I have extra time or I can do it on the weekends, I can put down the side. So for instance, I write a national column for American City Business Journals. And so I would love to be working on those columns all the time, but that's not how I make my money and that's not a first priority for me. So I put that off to the side. I think about getting involved in certain nonprofits and I realize, you know what, I can only have so much bandwidth. Maybe I just do one and that's it. With the clients, you realize what's the most important things that they value from you? What are they buying from you that would be most important to them? And narrow that down and do that well so you don't become overwhelmed and you don't become frustrated and it isn't so stressful. I work with family business uh, companies all the time, so I am working in a variety of different areas, and I basically look at what is the things they need to know to do now that will make them successful, and also at the same time, they will value from me and I will be successful with them because they feel like they've gotten good value from me and they'll renew my contract. So. Find out from your customers what's most important for them or do it through observation or knowing about this. Make sure you cover those first and everything else that you're doing that isn't absolutely dire or uh, super important to be done, put that in a, a different basket and then wait till you have some time to do it. I typically love working on Sundays. I work every Sunday typically from 8, 8.30 in the morning till Sounds crazy, but until about nine o'clock at night. But I love working Sundays because I feel like I get a lot of stuff done. So I'll put a lot of things off till Sundays. I always take Saturdays off. It's very rare that I work on the Saturday, but that's what I do. I put things off to the side that can be handled later, only the most important things. And I don't want to be stressed and make mistakes. I don't think you do either. So that's what I would do if I were you. The next question uh, comes from, aha, Heather Brockman. Uh, Heather had written to us earlier in this process, and so we have another question from Heather, which is, when acquiring a company with existing employees, what is the best way to introduce them to the existing team and implement our current system? I've reached out to a local groomer who is selling her company. I'm looking to buy her three vans, and it will come with her two other groomers and a bather. I want to make sure the transition is smooth as possible, but she has no boundaries with them, and I want to make sure I'm able to keep them on board, but let them know how we run things it won't be the same. We offer high-end holistic grooming experiences for busy pet owners whose animals are part of the family. 
So I would do two things, and I've done acquisitions before, and especially small business acquisitions. First of all, if I'm acquiring it, I would make sure that the owner uh, tells them that uh, being acquired, who they're being acquired from, uh, make an introduction, and have you sit there. Maybe you uh, bring in pizza or bring in lunch, something where you can meet with them. And before you buy the business, if it's important to you, to find out if they're willing to stay and talk about how you operate your business, but you're also interested in constant improvement. If there are things that they do uh, that you think would be great for your business, you're willing to do that because nobody wants to be acquired and think that the acquirer thinks they're stupid or incompetent. So you have to tell those people about what they do well in an authentic way. So you come in, you want to um, get a chance to know the people, ask them what they love about working about uh, at this business, what they think they do really well, before you start telling them how the changes you're going to make and before you make those changes, see if their way is good as well. Maybe they have a superior way. Maybe they have a way that works for them. You know, a lot of companies when they're doing acquisitions, they might align their HR and accounting, but they might, uh, that they often allow the people that they're acquiring to continue to run the business the same way because they see that business is successful. They have a process and methodology that works for them. And it's another way to make sure that uh, you get people who want to come on board and are happy. What you don't want to see is that if you thought you're not only buying the equipment but getting the people as well, then you want to make sure that those uh, people know that you're looking forward to having them uh, join your team, that you want to learn from them as well, that you're not going to just tell them what to do, that you realize they've been successful, acknowledge the success, and uh, want to see how we can integrate the two processes to make it even better. I wouldn't come in with, we do it this way, and this is the right way and the only way we're going to do it, and we're not going to be flexible to listen to anything you've done uh, because we don't care about what you've done. Again, that will make them feel like failures, and they'll start to look to go to your competition, or they'll become the competition. The three of them will get together and say to the owner, hey, well, if you want to retire, we'll just buy this business, or we'll look for somebody, or we're just going to go out and start our own thing. I don't think you want to go and do that. So I think you have to be very smart about it. And you want to go and have the owner introduce you, tell them, uh, and have the owner say what they like about you while they're selling you uh, that business. And have the, uh, it's like uh, making a warm introduction in the sale. And then after you've gotten a chance to meet with those people, earn their trust, then you want to introduce them to your team and do it in a, um, an environment that's comfortable. Maybe you'll have a barbecue at your house and make an introduction. Maybe you have them come in and visit and have your people visit. Then maybe you will have your groomer work with their bather, uh, uh, with your bather and have the people uh, mixing it up and all working together so they get to know each other. But realize you're gonna have to be very patient and make sure these people feel good about what they've done. If you don't make them feel good and they feel like they're being conquered, this is not going to go well for you. And what you end up with is just the assets of the business. And by the way, if you're buying the business, you want to do an assets uh, purchase. You do not want to buy the corporation itself because you don't know the debts and other problems that corporation has. You don't know about future lawsuits, any of those things. So be smart about it and get an experienced lawyer who's done a lot of these deals so they could protect you. Well, Heather's question was the last question we had for the day. I'm, uh, I was excited to answer those questions. I really enjoy them. I thought they were very good for lots of people who may be listening into this. And I look forward to seeing you all next month. I hope you're enjoying your summers and really getting out there. And hopefully your area is demasking as well as we have here in the Philadelphia area. And that you're going to go and take some cool trips this summer and spend them 
uh, quality time with family and friends, barbecuing and having fun. Well, everyone, take care. Have a great rest of your day and be safe.